That was amazing. I, Serene didn't wear a dress even for her wedding. <laughs> but for the Lord, she would do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I believe God has a special word for us, so let's ask the Lord to open our hearts so that He could give us understanding and wisdom to apply His word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this family. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you've done through us and what you will do through us, especially in these last days, that we will stand up like shining torches and light to tell the world that you are the overcomer and that you wear the victor's crown. So, Father, I just ask that you speak to us. For some of us who know you, that, Lord, our heart will be encouraged and that we will walk with you faithfully. For those of us who do not know you, I ask that this will be a day of salvation for them, that many of them who are looking for a purpose in life, something for which they can give their life to, they will find it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, for Holy Spirit, I just ask that you will cover this place with your presence. Let your spirit of wisdom and power move among us so that we will hear your word and we will apply it deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Basically, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is saying to every one of us, I am coming soon. Turn to the guy next to you and say, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus said, I'm, I'm coming soon. Now the question is, how does this statement strike you? Is this a warning to you? Or is this a promise you look forward to? Does it bring fear? Or does it bring faith? When you hear this, does it stir up some kind of consternation or concern in your heart? Or does it stir up comfort? When I began the book of Revelation, I reminded everybody that the book of Revelation is not just about God's program for the end time, but rather how Jesus Christ revealed Himself in these last days. It is the revelation of the Lord Jesus. And when the Bible says Jesus is coming again in these last days, Jesus is revealing Himself to the world in three ways. Number one, He's coming as an angry avenger, bringing cleansing to this world taking away all the lawlessness, all the injustice, all the hurts and pain that we have brought upon each other. You know, people like to say, you know, if God is a good God, why is there so much evil in this world? Because He may allow us to make that choice, but it's coming to an end. He's going to come as an angry avenger to clean house because He's a loving God, because He's a righteous God, He would not allow this to go forever. Not only would He come as the angry avenger cleansing this world of the pain and the sin and the, and the degradation that has reduced human being to less than what God has made us to be. He's also coming as the awesome conqueror, bringing about the conquest of the kingdom of God. The Bible says the book of Revelation will end with a statement, the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he comes not only as an angry avenger, not only as an awesome conqueror, the Bible tells us that eventually the purpose of Christ's coming is that he's coming as an affectionate, uh, affectionate lover in the ultimate consummation whereby He will take His people into His presence and forever enjoy the intimacy of a God who loves His people and a people who love their God. The question is, when Jesus is coming, would you know Him to be an angry avenger or just an awesome conqueror? Will, we, will you know Him as an affectionate lover? The answer to that all depends on you and I. It depends on how we respond 
to God's messages for us given to the seven churches. You see, the seven messages given to the seven churches is to prepare us for a second coming so that we will meet our God not as an angry avenger, not just as an awesome conqueror, but as an affectionate lover that will take us into His presence and into His bosom where we will enjoy Him forever and ever. These seven messages are to be read to all the seven churches. Although each of the message have a particular application to a church, every of the seven churches in Asia Minor was to hear all the seven messages. Why? Because in every church, there are these seven types of Christians who must respond to the seven messages accordingly. And so today, we want to respond to what God is speaking to us so that we will be ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as an overcomer to receive the crown of glory that He will place upon us. It doesn't take great prophetic insight to realize that the world can come to an end. Look at the conflict that's around the world that is escalating. Look at all the irrational brutality that's taking place in Middle East that can trigger off tremendous global conflict. And God says, now we got to take heed because He's coming soon. So today, we're going to listen to God's message to the church in Philadelphia with a sense of urgency, with a sense of practical application for our life because we got to be ready for all that is about to happen. So let's read with me in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Revelation 3, 7 to 13, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem who is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an year, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You know, the church in Philadelphia does not strike us as a very outstanding church. Yet it is one of the two churches out of the seven churches that receive only commendation from Jesus Christ. No rebuke. They have not done anything wrong, but only positive commendation. You see, among the seven churches, there are four churches, Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, where Jesus affirmed some of the good things they have done, but on the other hand, rebuked strongly some of the things that they have not done. So they had both commendation as well as rebuke, and they are warned to take care of those things that they have not done right. There is only one church. There are four churches that have both good and bad. There's one church in which Jesus had nothing good to say about. And that's the church we're going to consider next week. All right? The church of Laodicea. Nothing good at all. You better take heed. You better come next week. Nothing good about that church. And I'm not going to take the thunder away from Daniel. And it doesn't look like it's that bad, but nothing good at all. 
But out of seven churches, there are two churches, the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia, where Jesus said nothing bad at all, but only good things about them. So today, God wants us to consider the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was about 23 miles southeast of Sardis that we considered last week. Sardis used to be the capital of the whole region there. It was plagued with earthquakes, so there are many challenges in the city. Beside all the idolatry and all the uh, synagogues that oppose the preaching of the gospel, Jews that were not really Jews but deny the power of God, that have given Paul lots of trouble, always going around undermining whatever he has preached concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a young city. It is pretty prosperous because the soil was fertile, but it was a small city, an outpost of the Greek culture, a frontier town. The city of Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia, is not exactly what the world might see as a star performer. There weren't any fireworks in Philadelphia. They were ordinary. In fact, very ordinary. In fact, if you compare them to the church in Smyrna, the other church where Jesus had only commendation, they didn't even suffer as much as the church in Smyrna. In Smyrna, the, the Lord said that you have been fighting on, holding on, but some of you, you're going to be thrown into prison. Some of you are going to get martyred. In Smyrna, there was incredible suffering, incredible heroes of faith that came out from that place, Smyrna, and Jesus had only good things to say about them. But not in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was just ordinary suffering. No major loss of life. Yes, the folks from the synagogue would ridicule them. God doesn't love you. You belong to the Jesus cult. You are just kind of a fringe group of people. You lie. They were rejected, ridiculed, excluded by old family and friends who were part of the Judaistic uh, tradition. To whom the evil one whisper, you guys are unlovely, unworthy, rejected. The church in Philadelphia was just an ordinary church. It's like a simple, ordinary bride. I could imagine this housewife Frumpy, cleaning the house, one day at a time doing laundry, nothing significant. And yet, listen to Jesus' evaluation of this church. In verse 8, Jesus said, I know your deeds. And in the second part of verse 8, he says, I know you have little strength. They are not a superstar church. They were not a mega church they were there holding on to the faith, doing everything that God has called them to do. Nothing outstanding, no big record they have said for anybody. But the Lord said, I know that you have little strength. Yet, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And then in verse 10, Jesus said, you have kept my command and endure patiently. There's only one description of the church in Philadelphia. It's a church with faithful endurance, faithful perseverance. Say perseverance. perseverance. Say faithful. faithful. The Philadelphia church was a church were faithfully persevering, a church that never gives up. It doesn't quit. It goes on, holding on to the Word of God living out what God has called them to be and to become. And you know what the Bible says? Jesus was pleased with their faithful perseverance. They refused to give up. They kept on keeping on, doing what God has called them. They hung in there in obedience. They were not star swimmer. All they were doing, the church in Philadelphia, was treading water. But they didn't stop treading water. They didn't give up. They continued to do what God has called them to do. They insisted 
on standing by their faith even when the synagogue of Satan, the Judaizers ridiculed them to the point where Jesus said, I honour your position. I honour all that you have taken from them. Just standing firm. I will make them apologise to you. I will make them worship you and recognise that you were right in all that you do. But what did they do to deserve them? All they did was to tread water. To keep on keeping on. To persevere. To endure. There do not seem to be some apparent major victory. The whole city didn't turn around, but they stood their ground. They did not quit. They did not throw in the tower. In fact, to the church in Smyrna, the other church who was also suffering, to whom Jesus was pleased, Jesus said to the Smyrna church, Revelation 2.10, Be faithful even to the point of death. I will give you the crown of life. I will give you the crown of life, which means you don't have it yet. Hang in there and I will give it to you. But yet to the church in Philadelphia, Jesus is saying, well done, you persevere, you hung in there. And in Revelation 3.11, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have. What is that? So then no one will take your crown away. As far as Jesus was concerned, they already have the crown. They are winner. Even more than Smyrna, who was prepared to die and go to prison. They just simply tread water. They just simply stood still where everyone is attacking them. They were simply willing to obey God no matter what the cost is. And Jesus said, just keep on doing it because you already have the crown of life. Don't give up so that no one will rob you of that. In other words, Jesus was saying, you have made it. Well done. The crown is yours. Just hold on. Don't lose it. Church, as I was preparing this message, the Lord really ministered to me. And one of the things the Lord told me was this. The Lord says, say to FCBC, you are like the Philadelphian church. It is a rhema word for us. Now, I don't say those things randomly or flippantly. What I'm saying is that this is a prophetic word because I heard from God saying to us, well done. We are faithful. We persevere. We refuse to give up. And you know, uh, many things. God only not only speaks to us. God says, there's a reason why you happen to preach on this church. You see, I... I give up, you know, I work the sermon, uh, you know, uh, preaching schedule and, uh, and, and I don't do it just because, uh, you know, I want a particular place, but just that I'm available, that this is the best time and so forth and other people. And, and when I receive it and I heard it and the Lord said to me, the reason I give you this is so that you can tell the church in FCBC, well done. Because you are a church who persevere who does not give up. I'm pleased with you, not because of how big or how small the church is, not because how fast it grows or how slow it's growing, not because of the church building, not because of what you've done in the past, because I am pleased with you because you endure and keep on doing what the Lord has called you to do. And that's what matters. We are a church who does not give up. We are known by our dogged, stubborn, relentless perseverance in just insisting on living for God and doing what God has called us to do. You know, God has been teaching me in the last 10 years, don't be caught up in the spirit of this world. You know, it's easy to do church and yet we are just as worldly as anybody else because all we care about is how big our church be, how fast it will be, the kind of track record we have, the kind of uh, accolades people have. Now, I'm not saying that these are wrong. God, if God chooses to give it to us, fine, praise God. But if all we are motivated by that, we're just like any other worldly person who wants to climb up a social ladder, climb up a career ladder and just want to be recognized by man and instead of doing the purposes of God. As we do that, if God God chooses to give us this fine, but God is not impressed by all these things which He gives us because all these things come from the Lord. But God will be impressed with the purposes and the desire and the passion of our heart, which is something that He will not insist, but something that we must voluntarily give to us. God 
man looks at outward appearance. Otherwise, I can tell you, this is a very vain thing. I can tell you, believe me, if all you're going for, for 1728, is that, wow, I can have my 12, I can have my 144. I can tell you, it doesn't give you joy. It doesn't give you meaning because the price you pay is too high. You do it because it's the heart of God. It's because God's heart is to reach out to the lost and to disciple the nation. And you do it because God asks us to do it. We do it, that's all. And if that is so, God is pleased. God doesn't compare us in terms of how big our church is or how great the building is or how big the budget is. Otherwise, we're caught up in the spirit of this world. What God is looking for is we're simply obedient and don't stop doing what God has called us to do. And that's the legacy God has given to me through you, to you. This is how God has graciously taught me to do. In the initial part of the church, we grew because God gave me the vision of the cell church. And, and thank God, and it was not easy. It's not easy to believe God that all the cell can be vibrant so that the cell becomes a major open door of the church because everybody came to our church to listen to me preach. But God says, don't let's get them to listen to you preach. Go there, go into there and mobilize everybody to become pastors and ministers of the Spirit of God. It was hard. I couldn't even see it, but we just did it. And by the mid-1990s, we were known around the world. I had, we had seven schools that taught churches and pastors how to do it in Kazakhstan, in South Africa, in, in, uh, in Malaysia too, and in Philippines and in Taiwan. And we were doing well. And then God spoke to me about the G12. And Pastor Nina and I went to uh, Bogota and when we met Pastor Caesar, we said, this is a man of God and he had a word from God. Doesn't mean everybody has to recognize that, but God spoke to us. We said, follow him, do the G12. And when we came back, we gave up all the seven schools. We went to them and said, God has changed. And if you want to follow us, fine. If not, we understand, do what you're doing because we honor you. And most of them said, I will watch how FCBC does first. Lah. Then we will follow. And for the next 15 years, we give our heart to it. And you know what happened? I lost more people than I gained people. We won many people. In fact, this whole church is almost like new compared to 15, 20 years ago because all the old ones have left. It's painful. It's difficult. And I press on there. I press on because I want to believe that I heard right and I believe I heard right from God and I will do it. It's not about the result. It's about obedience to God. And meanwhile, we have been a blessing. Philippines have exploded with G12. Korea is exploding with G12. Now Thailand is exploding with G12. And these are the things we taught them. And when we taught them, church began to double in size, but not our church. Our church grew smaller. People actually laugh at us. Look at, look at FCBC. They can't even make it. But I want to tell you this. It never bothered me. I just sought the Lord and said, is this what you want me to do? If this is from your word, if this is what I believe, then I will press on. And so when I tell you about 1728, it is not about just having some more numbers. It's about the spirit of G12 that all of us must have our 12, our 12 must have our 144, our 144, 1728. And we're going to believe God and we'll press on. Whether we succeed or fail, we'll press on because it is God who gives the increase. For us, it is to obey and do all that God wants you. I can tell you, if that is not the driving force of your, your purpose in 1728, you will not only fail, you will feel miserable. But I press on. In the, in the middle of 1990s, God told me, I want you to rise up and bring about a unity within the churches in Singapore. I almost laughed. I said, me? For some of you who don't know, do you know that this church was started because a church was split? Because I was fired from the church? And at that time, in the beginning of this church, I was known as a pastor who had split the church. The church split into three ways. Some follow me, some stay in the church, and the rest disappeared. That was my reputation. That was my track record. And for God to use someone whose track record is to split a church, to unify the church, it's a joke. As far as I'm concerned, 
I said, God, I don't even have the diplomatic skill. I'm not a very diplomatic person. I will just tell you straight in between the eyes what I believe is right or wrong. I don't know how to play politics. I don't know. But God says, you got to do it. And I just say, Lord, I just need to pray. I need to get a few pastors and pray. 21 years have passed. And this year, we have 600 pastors gathered together in our yearly prayer summit. Something that the world wonders at because there is no such example anywhere in the world. Just this week, I call a meeting of all the senior pastors to talk about what is the way ahead. And I say, we've got to develop a Christian mindset and we've got to disciple every believer to be effectively applying the Christian mindset in the workplace. But pastors, you need to be disciples because we are the blockage. We must be the source of blessing to equip the saints. And 100 over pastor came, senior pastor. It's amazing what God has done. It's not because... I know exactly what to do. It's because God says, you persevere. There how many times I wanted to give up? How many times I got, you know, when I started, I said, God, I don't care about uniting the pastors because I don't even care about them. I don't like most of them, <laughs> to be honest. But now I've learned there's so much to learn from them just as they have to learn from each of us. Such a beautiful experience. You know, I'm just invited to many countries just to share this so that they will begin to do what God has called them to do to unite the churches. 15 years ago, God called me to go into arts and entertainment. And there I lost a lot of people again. People don't understand why a 50-year-old man will go and start to become a ma magician. And they say, oh, it must be the Ming Sing Mong. Just want to be a celebrity. I mean, he got bored in this church. He wants to do something glamorous. But you don't understand the last 15 years how torturous he has become. How difficult it was to do something that I do not know how to do well. I, by God's grace, can preach quite well. I mean, decently well, all right? That's my gifting. I have been a pastor for 20 over years then, but I've never learned how to do this. But I persevere. And you can see some of the old video where I give a report to the church and I'm, I'm just kind of flat out and I just say, the reason I'm doing this is just to obey Jesus. I don't understand why I'm doing this, but Jesus said, you must do this. And I tell you something, God is showing me that it is an impact. When Pastor Caesar went with me to Shanghai, he came to me, he said, Pastor Lawrence, don't stop what you're doing. This is what it takes, okay, to win China for Christ. Keep on doing it. I did a major spiritual warfare last night on your behalf. And God says, keep on doing it. Because I saw the audience Watching this show, this is not a Christian show, it's just a good, you know, a storyline. And people were crying, God is going to use you. I don't know. After this, no one is offering to bring me back. But doesn't matter. I just obey. You understand? I just obey. I just know what the next, I don't know what the next step is. I obey, but I know, you know, we just got to do it. When I stood up to speak about social issue on a public square, and people say, wow, you're so brave, ah. you know, you're, so, ah, you're not scared, you are fearless. And those people tell us, never stand next to me and speak like me, you know. Oh, gee, oh, Lawrence, you're great, you know, I'm behind you, far behind you. And I spoke not because I'm some kind of hero. I spoke because God says, you got to speak up for the truth. Somebody needs to do that. And when I spoke up and did some of this thing, people warned me, be careful. you got a new building coming up. You're going to have all sorts of trouble. And I said, i got to speak the word of God. If I don't build a building, if this church is closed down, it doesn't matter because I'm called to speak the word of God and i got to be faithful. That's the spirit of FCBC. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> and because of that, this church is a persevering church. We push on. I am amazed at the leaders. You know, 
start sell and then people leave them and walk away and rebel and then challenge them and, and then people say, you know, pastor only want numbers and then, oh, there again, 1728, you see. But God wants us to do it. We will do it. And I want to challenge you. If you are into 1728, thank God, I was, I was told by my, all my team pastors, we have a new spirit here. People are just gung-ho. Not that we are very successful yet, but we're gung-ho. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Some have quit. Thank God, not a lot. But I'm going to tell you this. The minute you quit, you fail. You realize that? The minute you quit, you fail. You don't quit. If God tells you something to do, do it. I remember the first season of Love Singapore. God told me in the year 20, 2001 to go into uh, uh, the, uh, the then uh, uh, stadium, the outdoor stadium. And uh, now it's put, torn down. And have seven wave harvests. When it came to that time, I realized that the momentum was not there. I realized that there are some churches who just talk but never get in. And, they, and some suggested, why don't we just book the indoor stadium, at least look good, I know, pack it up with 10,000 people, and then at least, wow, oh, now good. But I sought the Lord, the Lord said, what did I tell you? National stadium. And I said, if God says national stadium, it's national stadium. How do you know? If you don't go there, how do you know? Maybe God might break out and God can bring a revival. But we just got to obey. So I went to national stadium. And it was pathetic. Nothing significant happened. But you know what? It doesn't matter because we obey God. God says there, we go there. And maybe God remembers that. God remembers that we just simply obey Him. Even if the world thinks it's stupid and it's not expedient and it's not prudent because God says so. And I believe in all my heart it was God's will. Maybe God just wants to show us without Him we are pathetic, but we just could be there. But I believe that forms the foundation of the, 21, for, uh, of the 14 years that follow that love Singapore never died. And it continued to grow from strength to strength. Listen, church. What God is looking for is a spirit of obedience. Let spirit just hear the word of God. Not in isolation. You must do it in community. We're not talking about one crazy man just stand up and say, do this, do that. But together as a body, recognizing it. That this is from God and just does it. And don't quit. This point has helped me for years. Don't quit. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're treading seems all uphilled, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns as every one of us sometimes learns and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up though the pace seems slow, you might succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tin of the clouds of doubt. And you can never tell how close you are. It may be near, but it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things get worse that you mustn't quit. You mustn't quit. However, your marriage is deteriorating. However difficult it is communicating to your wife or your husband. However hard your children are. The question is, you don't quit. You've got to continue to do what God calls you to do as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a wife. And you continue. It doesn't matter how your spouse is behaving. We will just obey God. And God says, well done. Well done. My faithful servant. So pleased was God with the Philadelphian church that he made three sets of promises for them that he didn't even give to Smyrna who was prepared to die and be martyrs. Just because you're a martyr doesn't make you better. It's just God's will for your life. And these three sets of promises I want to share with you that we can claim. Now, last night I preached all this and it didn't click very well. I walked away kind of, how come, huh? Didn't sit very well. So the Lord woke me up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Maybe I'm still jet lagged, but uh, it's good to be jet lagged a little bit. Wake up in the morning, all quiet. And the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord says, you just gave the three promises. You didn't understand, son, 
why I'm so pleased with the Philadelphian church. In fact, the Lord showed me that these three promises indicate this is what the Philadelphian church was going for. And because God knows their heart, this is what they were longing for. God gave them these promises. So as I give you the three promises that God gave to the Philadelphian church, it is really the reason why God was so pleased with them because these are the three things they were looking for in the first place that indicates the purity of their heart that caused God to be so generous with them. Let me give it to you one at a time. First, the first promise is that God promises a special passage, a special open door for them. A special passage, an open door for them. Revelation 3, 7 to 8 says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. This seems to refer to a promise that the Messiah has given to His people in Isaiah 22, 22, which reads, I will place on His shoulder, the shoulder of the Messiah, the key to the house of David. What He opens, no one can shut. And what He shuts, no one can open. It's a key to God's kingdom. But it's interesting that maybe in quoting this verse, or maybe not, The writer of Revelation, John, received this message that says that he is the one who holds the key of David. Not the key of the house of David, but the key of David. I think that's interesting because David was a man with little power when we know him. Just like the Philadelphian church with little power. He was such a shepherd boy, an ordinary boy who just simply obeyed God in tending the sheep. But he has a desire. He has a desire to know the power and the reality of God. You see, the Apostle Paul had three wishes in his life. And this is really reflected here. In Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the share in the fellowship of his suffering. That was what drove the Apostle Paul, not big ministry, not accolades from man, not great record in the annals of uh, church history, but simply this, in my life, whatever I do, I want to know Him and empower the resurrection and to share in the fellowship of His suffering. The first thing that these people are looking for, they want an open door to the power of God. They want to experience the reality as weak as they are to the power of God. And that's the key of David because David was an ordinary, simple man with no resources in himself. But as he was faithful in watching after the sheep, he was able to tear the lion and the bear apart with his bare hand. He saw the power of God. God opens door to him to experience his power. And then he kind of staggered into the battlefield and then found this godless Philistine who challenged the army of the living God. The zeal of God consumed him. He says, that cannot be. He was not trying to show off that he's a great fighter. He was just saying, cannot. God's name cannot be put to shame. And so he stand up and he fought Goliath and he prevailed. And then he was brought into the court of King Saul. And what was he doing? He played the harp. That was all he could do. What can a little boy, or no, he's not a little boy, he's a young man who plays the harp. But when he plays the harp, just something he does to worship God, he drove out evil spirit from King Saul. He taps into the power of God. The simple harp player become a ghostbuster. And God began to show him what it is to experience the power of the resurrection. It doesn't mean his life is easy. For more than 20 years, he's wandering in the wilderness, but he learned to fight the war. He learned to survive. He learned to work with all the scums of the land. 
Until he was established. It was when he was established that is when he fell. But before that, he just was a simple nobody but just obeying God. And he was faithful to God. And everywhere he turned, God opened the door. You know, commentator talks about what is this open door? And many suggest, oh, open door for Philadelphia means, wow, great opportunity for ministry and great, you know, uh, healing services. Doesn't seem to be so because Philadelphia was not heard of again. We don't know. That kind of accomplishment. I believe it's more than that. I believe that God knew that they, as simple as they are, they just want to say, we are so weak, but Lord, I want to see your power in this weakness. And God opens door for them to experience the power of God. The church in Philadelphia have an open door to the power of God. To the extent that the evildoers who call themselves Jews, who are not Jews, the synagogue of Satan, they came and apologized to them and acknowledged that they were right. They understood what the apostle Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, my favorite verse. We have this treasure in earthen vessel to show that the transcendent power belongs to God. Isn't this true of our founder, the Lord Jesus himself? He was one who persevered to do the will of the Father to the end. Jesus was a carpenter in a little frontier town called Nazareth. So small, so insipid was a town that when Jesus started to get, become famous, the Jewish leader said, no, no, don't worry about that. Can anything come out on Nazareth? I mean, it is like Timbuktu to them. Young people don't know what Timbuktu is. When I was going to school, we refer to Timbuktu as like nobody, just a small place. Nobody give it any, you know, significance. He never wrote a book. He never held public office. He never earned a degree. He never traveled more than 200 miles away from the place of his birth. Yes, there was miracle, but he hid them from the people. People get healed. He said, don't tell, just keep quiet. To the world, he looked like an ordinary life. And people begin to see something extraordinary in him, follow him and says, come and check me out. Jesus was faithful. He persevered to the end. And that's why the book of uh, Hebrew, the writer said in Hebrew chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What was Jesus known for? Enduring. Because he simply obeyed the Father. He just did what God has called him to do and paid the price to do it. He endured the cross, scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose faith. He was crucified between two ordinary thieves. He was one among the hundreds of thousands of people who were crucified by Rome. Crucifixion was a common thing. He wasn't a, you know, we just saw, nowadays we just see a cross. Wow, you all stand alone. I tell you, you walk the road around Roman Empire, you see crucifix everywhere. People just die. Because the Roman power was a very cruel power. He lived a very ordinary life. But in his weakness, he exposed the glory of God. And how Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more about my weaknesses so that the Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty, for when I'm weak, that I'm strong. Church, you know why God wants us to push for 1728? He wants to open a door for us to experience the power of God in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our failure, in spite of having tried in the, in the past and it never worked. But we say, God, if that's what you want me to do, I will do it until I see your power at work. We were at Bogota. And one of my staff, Deborah, Pastor Deborah, was chatting with one of the cell leaders. And this girl was set aside as a cell leader last September. But she had no one, nobody. She's supposed to find her 12, but she had nobody. And she just fasted and prayed and cried and cried 
and cry until one day God says, don't cry anymore. I will give it to you. And the following week, he went to church. He saw somebody that was kind of a bit lost and realized that this person apparently made a commitment to Christ, but nobody consolidated her. She consolidated her. And working with her since September last year to January, they want 20 people to Christ, now meeting in two cell groups. And here is this simple, not very gifted lady who has no idea how to do it. Just simply say, I will endure. And you know what God says? I will open a door that no man can close. You know why some of you give up? Because you're too self-conscious about success. You don't want to fail. You're so scared. Ha! Huh? July or August, I uh, must find two. I want also don't have. How? I'm going to look very malu. God looks at our heart and says, if this is what God has called us to do, if that's how God, we never force anybody. In fact, I told all my team leader, go down a line. If you don't, you don't believe, it's okay. Step aside. We'll find someone who believes. But you believe, I want to tell you this, don't give up. And if you've given up, it's not about giving up. It's not about the 1728. It's about the fact that you were not faithful in enduring. And you are not able to endure because you're conscious of yourself and you're not conscious of God. You're too conscious of your weaknesses, but you're not so desirous that in my weakness, in earthen vessels such as I, so that the surpassing power may be of God. Why well, go out and do many things? Because God tells me to do so. And I open doors. And I just do it not because I can, I just have no idea. But God always come and say, if this is me, I will show you how I can use you in your weakness. So that's the first thing, a promise of special passage, an open door. God wants to give that to you. Is that the desire of your heart? That's why God looked at the Philadelphian church. God just saw the heart of them wanting to experience the power of God in their weakness. They choose not to look at their weakness. They choose to look at the power of God and God says, I'll open a door for you. That's the second thing. God's promise, not only a special passage with an open door. God promised to the church in Philadelphia a special protection. Look with me, Revelation 3.10. Since you have kept my commands to endure patiently, since you are willing to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. God promised the church in Philadelphia that He will somehow keep them from this hour of trial and tribulation. Now, many people have different interpretation, which I'm not going to argue about because uh, we'll find out in the end. Many people believe that before the tribulation comes, God is going to take us up in a rapture and we are caught up and we are not involved in this. I personally don't uh, believe in that. I have no time to elaborate. I've done a lot of study in that. I feel like much of this is uh, uh, because of just inferences from Scripture. There's no direct a real reference from Scripture uh, that can show that. And secondly, I feel like it comes from uh, a Western church that is used to comfort, who is never, who is just so happy to say that God is going to deliver us on our trial. And they will say that, you know, this trial is so bad uh, uh, that, 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 wow, God will take us away from it. And I, I, I keep telling my professor, I say, have you ever been to the Holocaust in, in Second World War where all the people are lining up for the gas chamber? What can be worse? You can tell them, oh, now it's only localized. You know, one day it's going to be all the world. For this guy is lining up to die. It, it, it doesn't matter if the whole world uh, is happening or not happening. This is my, my world and my world is coming to an end. I met with refugees from Cambodia who, when the Poi Pot army came into Phnom Penh, fall in the whole city of Phnom Penh, which is about 2 million over people, just without notice, just fall in, don't take anything, and march them into the jungle, and they spent five years in the jungle. I met men that came out of it and said, uh, Pastor Kong, everyone I ever know in my life is dead. My wife, my children, my, my, my relative, my friends, they are all dead. Can you imagine? We just take you out there and now go to the middle of... Uh, you know, Malaysian jungle with nothing and live. Most of us would survive because we are not 
We're not, you know, that kind of live off the land kind of guy. They add the rats, the snake, the, I mean, everything that can be eaten, eaten, the bark of the trees are all eaten, and yet three quarters of them die. They die by the hundreds of thousands. I say, you tell them, oh, you know, the wrath that's going to come is worse, but God would, no, there is suffering around the world all these years. I don't believe that this taking, keep you from the hour of trial means that he's going to take us out that is popularized by this show. You know, left behind. I, I don't think so, okay? Uh, you study some of the verses that say left behind. Those who are taken were taken for judgment, not taken for, to be with Jesus. You look in the gospel, all right? Uh, but, but here the word is that, you know, we will keep you from, the Greek word is used in John 17, 15, where Jesus prayed for his disciples. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That's the same Greek word. Like, I keep you from this hour. I'll protect you. I will give you a special protection. And if you read the book of Revelation, you read on in the order of judgment. God sometimes sent judgment and said, but not those who have been sealed by me, not those who have, have, have got my seal upon them. God give them special protection. That doesn't mean that they have a good time. Some of them may die even of a martyr, but there's a special protection that comes upon them. You know, I used to work with a man in a, who was like my classmate, a much older pastor when I was going to school in Dallas. And his ministry is to help people die. In other words, people are going to die. He goes in there, just worship the Lord and help them to have a good passageway. It's like the opposite end of a midwife. <laughs> and that was his calling. And he saw glory, people go away gloriously and so forth. And he made a statement I never forgot. One day he was preaching to our class and he said that, you know, I've learned something. If it's time to die, God will give us the grace to die. And if you think you're going to die and somehow you don't find the grace to die, probably you'll not die. Okay? God give us the grace. And I want to tell you this. If God wants you to be martyred, He will give you a special grace. A special grace. There's a special protection that comes upon us. It's like Stephen, when he was about to be stoned, he saw in heaven Jesus sitting on the throne. And he saw that he was caught up with the presence of Jesus that God has given him that grace. So, so, Yesterday morning, I woke up early. Uh, no, not early. I woke up late because I stayed the whole night working on my message. And I was preparing coffee for my wife. And, and the Lord said to me, if I tell you to go to Syria right now and tell the ISIS, repent and be baptized, <laughs> will you do it? I struggled a little bit. I said, Lord, you must make it very clear. <laughs> but you make it very clear, I'll do it. I mean, you just get someone to know me. Maybe not so bad. Huh? Just go in and do some prayer walk. Can we do that? If I call a team right now to go to Syria for a prayer walk, if God wants me to do it, we do it. And I believe, and I, I watched some of this gross you know, picture where the head was being you know, cut off in this little pen knife. Uh, I said, Lord, if that's my destiny, you're going to give me the grace to do that. I kind of counted the time. I mean, it's bad, huh? but not so long, huh? Will you do that? Will you leave your wife and your children to do that? Some of you, your wife is an idol, your children are idols in your life. When God asked me to do something, I did. You know, years ago, I was with Pastor Daniel. I was not a pastor then. We were in Bogota. And the presence of God was there and Daniel cried and cried and cried and cried. And I went to hug him and when I hugged him, he cried even more. And we went back to our room. And Daniel said, you know something, Pastor? Uh, uh, pa he didn't call me Pastor. He called me Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Daddy, you know, I hate the magic of love. You do in China. Because that robbed me of my whole family. You went with your sister. Okay? And some, one time I went even with... Uh, I went with everybody. My, so... The mother was gone, the sister was gone. My second daughter was in a uh, university campus. Then nobody was at home. He went through old level all by himself. Nobody was at home, uh, except the grandma. But, but he was lonely and he was very stoic about it. He said, never mind, go and serve God. But he felt so painful. And the day he cried, we hugged him. You know what? I never apologized for what I did. I knew I did what was right. And if the clock will be rewind, I will still do it. But you know, as we stand and obey God, 
God has a supernatural work in the life. And today, my son is used by God. He had to go through that. We are so protective of our children. You know, I tell you, I've seen that in those days where I'm planting churches and there are people, oh, everything must be your children, must be, a, must be a best. I tell you, I have people that went to Kazakhstan. Look at Pastor Bernard Chu and, and, and Pastor Allen. Went to Kazakhstan, took their children there. Not a very good place to develop your children. And they're prepared to be there for the rest of their life. And God has some plans, we brought them back. I tell you, today they're doing very well. Some of us got to surrender everything. And we got to believe that God is sufficient for us. He will protect us. He will protect our children. Now, I'm not just talking about negligence. I'm not talking about anyhow, and you don't care about your kids, and you just go and you ignore them. I tell you, people are not walking with, our children are not walking with Christ because they see in us inconsistency. And if my children are not what they should be because they saw some inconsistency in us, and for that, I will repent. For that, I say, God, have mercy. But there are times I need to stand on obeying God. And God says, I will protect you and your marriage and your children. Just as like I protected my people in the land of Goshen when the plague visited Egypt. They are protected. The things didn't happen to them because my hand was on. You know, Maybe the day is coming. You know, the day is coming. Jesus will only come back when the number of martyrs have been filled. You know why? Well, God is not bloodthirsty. God is always giving the world a chance. But there comes a moment where the numbers, I don't know what the number is, and thank God He doesn't give us a count. He gets us worried. All right? Uh, he keeps the number. And when the number is filled, that means enough is enough. I've given the world enough. They still kill my people, still devastate them. I am coming to take charge and clean house. And maybe you and I are part of the numbers in these last days. And we've got to leave our family and our children. But I want to tell you this. You, you know what? Doesn't it marvel, make you marvel when you read on Friday's paper that ISIS is recruiting all around the world and the Scotland government is having problems? How come one Scottish uh, girl actually go to Syria and volunteer and on the way there, pick up three of her friends from London, three London girl, teenagers to go there. You know why? The world is looking for something to die for. The, the, the young people are bored. They, they just know, what is this? Just go to school, get married or don't get married and then deal with that and live all right. We are looking for something bigger and, and in spite of all the brutality, they feel and they are deceived that so this is something bigger that can engulf the world but we have someone that's much bigger. He wears the victory the crowd. He has won the battle. He died for us on the cross. And we can endure to the end because God is going to protect us. And if we die, there will be protection too. Maybe that's the best production. Can Anthony say, Mongan Tiger? What are the three blessings? And you know what? I believe that God saw their willingness. The reason they endure is that not only do they want to experience the power of His resurrection, they are willing to share in the fellowship of His suffering. And because they are willing to share in the fellowship of His suffering with purity of heart, God says, I'll give you a special protection. No matter what happened, you're in my presence. Then there's the third promise, which is the best of all. This is not just special passage with open door. It's not just special protection. It's special privileges in our relationship with God. This is what he said, Revelation 3.12. He will overcome. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never will he leave. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. God says, because you are not worrying about what people think of you, you're not worrying about the result, whatever I tell you, you just do, even if it look bad on you, even if you pay the price, even if it's difficult, even if it's boring, just treading water, you keep doing it. I tell you what, I'm going to make you like a pillar in my temper. You are going to be significantly used. 
and I'll write the name of my God on you and the name of the city of my God on you and I will write on you my new name. If you study the book of Revelation and other places, there's a name that nobody knows. Revelation 2, 17 says, He who have ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give some hidden manna to eat. I will give you that special, special spiritual nourishment. And I will give him a white stone and on a stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. God says, you're so special to me because you desire to know me more than anything else. You don't care what people think. You're not going into the world to, to fight for a name for yourself. And all you do is to endure and trust water and never give up and say I will go on, pressing on doing what is right. You know what? I'm going to write on you my new name. The new name which nobody knows except you and me. It is an intimate relationship with God. You're going to hear the voice of God like no one else could hear. I can tell you God and Gus they say, oh, everybody the same. It's not the same. The people who are waiting to look and long and say that I may know him say you are going to know my new name. There's such an intimacy before I even come that you are so special and treasured. I will talk to you about things that I won't tell other people. I will talk to you face to face. You will know my heart. You will see things that nobody sees because you know me. And then the power of my resurrection. I was so touched by this promise. What are we looking for? You know why you give up? Because you think that a 1728 is going to make you look good. And God is not pleased. That's why you give up. But we do that so that I will know my God. And I will cause other people to know my God. And your heart is going to be filled with such a closeness with God because you lay hold of Him for the things that you cannot do. And you say, I will write my special name on you. The name that no one knows except you and me. I will whisper my heart to your heart. Is that what you desire? In other words, I will trust you with things that I would trust other people because you are faithful. I just trust you. And I give it to you. If that's what you desire, you will press on. And God knew that this was what the Philadelphian was desired after. They just keep on. They don't need to be outstandingly suffering for Jesus. They just do what God has called them to do. And God says, I will give you an open door to my power. I will give you a special protection. But I give you a level of privilege into my presence that no one else will know. And if that's what is worthwhile going for the 172, if that's what God has called us to do, then we go for it with all our heart so that we will know our God. Let me end with this story that really kind of pull it together. In October 1991, the weather front over New England, combined with the remain of a hurricane that was coming up on the East Coast, together they formed what they now call the perfect storm. It was the worst storm of the century. And when that storm hit to the north, a very well-known shipping boat, well-equipped, Andrea Gale, battled with all her expertise, power and might. It's written in a book. But nobody knew the story in the southern part of that place where a six-year-old practiced her ordinary back float. The story was this. Her father, John, did not check the weather report when he took this six-year-old daughter sailing off the Jersey Shore. Six miles out, he was shocked at how fast the wind came. And soon, their boat capsized. And they were in the water. The life preserver was still in the boat while the boat was swept out to the sea. So they were just floating by themselves. The father John realized that there's no way he could swim six miles back while holding the little girl. They would die together. He would have to swim alone for help. So he said to the little six-year-old girl who trusted him, Mary, remember I teach you how to float on your back and I told you you can float on your back as long as you want. Remember we practiced it in our swimming pool and you did so well. And you know you can sleep, lie down on your back and float for as long as you want to. Listen, I want you to practice that right now. 
I will swim to the shore, but believe me, I will come back for you. Three hours later, the coast guard found John. And for the next hour and a half, as darkness come on, they look for the little girl amidst the 20 to 30 foot swells. And miraculously, the spotlight on the coast guard boat pick up the girl and found her. And by that time, she has been floating for five hours. The guardsman later asked her, Mary, how did you do that? And she said, well, my daddy said I could float on my back as long as I wanted to and that he would come back for me. My daddy always does what he says. Meanwhile, Andre Gale, that great shipping boat, fought with courage and power and she sang with everybody in it. And there was glory in that. A book was written about it. But meanwhile, Mary just simply practiced floating on her back. And she didn't even know she was beating the storm of the sanctuary. You could say that faith in her daddy kept her from that great storm that came down on that whole East Coast. And God is looking at us and saying, I know you're small and weak, but keep on doing what I told you. Hold on. I'll be back. I'll keep you from the hour of trial. I'm coming soon. And to the struggling disciples, just before he died on the cross, Jesus said, you just keep on doing what I call you to do. I am going to swim into the heart of that perfect storm, hell itself, and I will be back after I've defeated it. You know what I discovered? Sometimes we are walking on water and we don't know it because we are not conscious of ourselves. Just like that little six-year-old girl didn't know that she beat the storm of the century. All she did was to do what the Father said to her. Simply float. Simply just stay above water. You know, this is what a Christian life is about. This is what God wants us to experience. And it's not to be experienced by the senior pastor of the church, but by every member of the church who say, I believe God for my 12, for my 144. I'll cry until I can't cry anymore, until I hear from God that it is finished. And I want to experience Him. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. And be able to share in the fellowship of His suffering. So to, to the Philippian church, uh, uh, so Philadelphia church, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown away. And to the Philadelphia church, I'm coming soon. It's a promise that brings comfort and assurance. Just like the six-year-old daughter said, Daddy's coming back. Just the church before where Pastor... Daniel preached the church in Sardis. They were wearing masks. And you know what God said to them? God says, if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you don't know what time I will come to you. That was a warning. That was a threat. But for us, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is a blessed hope. Only for those who are found faithful, persevere, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labour is not in vain in Him. Today, God is looking at us and saying, guys, I know how faithful you are. You know who I'm talking about? Some of those leaders who have lost cell member, lost cell group, and pastor say, do again. I say, do again, because I believe this is from the Lord. This is the heart of the Lord. You know, God, God delights in you because you're not looking unto man, you're looking unto God. You're not seeking the glory and approval of man. You're not trusting in your ability because you have failed enough to realize you can't do it. But you just say, I'll do it because God says so. And you know, you might one day wake up and realize you were walking on water. And you don't even realize it. In fact, it's good not to realize it. Because when you look at down and say, oh, I'm walking on water, you might just freak out and lose your faith. You know, most of us end up walking on water. It's all by the grace of God. Isn't that wonderful? Is there someone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ? Let me tell you this. What are you living for? 
You can throw all sorts of questions. Oh, why are you so much evil in this world if there's a good God and you can tell? And you can go on and on fighting it. And all it does is fill you with bitterness and anger and tension. But God says, you know, don't blame all the evil on me. You know, the world blame all the evil on me and take all the credit for all the good things that I do. I still rain on you. I still shine my sun on you. But God says, I'm giving the world a chance. I don't want anyone to perish. It's not God that has forgotten to come again. He's giving us a chance. But the day is coming where He's going to come back and settle the score. But meanwhile, you can know Him and the power of His resurrection. Even when you experience in a fellowship of suffering and you will never realize that even in pain, you can find the tremendous presence of God and His protection. The world will marvel. But you don't even do it just to marvel the world. You just do it because you love God. You please Him. He loves you. He died for you. He's the one who went back on shore. He sat there on the cross. All you need is to just lie and float. But He paid the price. He gave His life for you so that all you knew is to rest. Church, I can believe. You know, there are people who left the vision who said, I don't believe everybody can lead uh, 12 people and can become a leader of 12 and 144. I don't believe too by their own strength. But I believe it's possible because don't we believe we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us? That all things are possible through Him who believe? So why are we looking at, oh, this guy not very smart, this guy not very talented, this guy, he can't even talk properly, uh, this guy, you know, he's a bit like, you know, I don't know what, you know, but when the power of God hits him and he becomes a disciple of God, he can. Can't we believe what God believes? You think you're very smart, that's why God chose you, is it? No. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And finally, what do we stand before God for? Just being all that God wants us to be. If you never know Him, I want you to enter into this exciting. Why would people leave a beautiful place like England and go to Syria and try to fight the ISIS war? This is one something worth giving their life to. And I want to tell you, that's not worth it. But this is worth it. The Lord says, you will know me. I will write the name of my God on you, the name of the temple of my God, and I write on you my name. So if you do not know Jesus, Give your life to Jesus. But today, start afresh. Have, has any one of you given up? You've given up on your marriage, given up uh, uh, at trying what God has asked you to do, given up on yourself, given up serving the Lord because you were discouraged by other people, given up uh, living a holy life because you feel like you, you just cannot win that sin that so grip you. The Lord says, don't give up. The minute you give up, you fail. Fight the good fight. Finish the course. Run the race. And God has prepared a crown of righteousness for you and I. That's what we are looking for. We don't need the approval of man. We need that crown so that we can throw it at the feet of Jesus and say, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honour and praise. But today, if you have not come to know Jesus Christ, give your life to Jesus. All He did for you was to do everything it takes for your sin to be forgiven. He died for you on the cross. And if today you open your heart, the Bible says as many as receive Him, to them give the authority to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on His name. If today you just say, Lord, I'm not able, but I surrender my life to You. I want to live for You completely. You're the master of my life. Today, you can become a new creation. And if you have never done that, Make the decision, do it now. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. No one moving, please. I sense the presence of God. I sense that God woke me up to share this with you. Because there's somebody, you, who is lost. He said, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. When he said that, he's not saying that we are all terrible people, vow, immoral, murder. He's not saying that. But some of us are lost. We don't know what our life is about. We don't know where we are going. We don't know where we came from. And today, you just need to come back to the one who created you and died for you on the cross. So, with your head bowed, your eyes closed. If you have never prayed this prayer, to invite Jesus in your life, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. And when I lead you in this prayer, I will say one lie. I want you to follow after me aloud. Because the Bible says you must believe in your heart and 
confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. And if this prayer is for those who have never done this, you want to do it today. Why don't you do it today? And give your life to Jesus and follow Him all the rest of your life. When I'm praying and leading the new people praying this prayer for the first time, I want every Christian to join in, to accompany them as they make this very important prayer in their life. So let's just bow our head and close our eyes. No one looking around except those who are on duty. Follow after me when I pray. Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father in heaven, Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. To die for my sin. To die for my sin. Lord, forgive me for my arrogance. Lord, forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me for blaming you. Forgive me for blaming you. For all the problems of my life. For all the problems of my life. Today. Today. I open my heart. I open my heart. I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to come into my life. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Forgive my pride and arrogance. Forgive my pride and arrogance. And cleanse me by your blood. And cleanse me by your blood. And be my Lord and my Savior. And be my Lord and my Savior. As of this day. As of this day. I give you my life. I give you my life. Help me. Help me. To know you. To know you. And the power of your resurrection. And the power of your resurrection. And to share in your suffering. And to share in your suffering. Help me to follow you. Help me to follow you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want every head to be bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around except those on duty. I know that there's somebody you who have prayed to receive Christ. This message was for you. God has spoken to you and you prayed with all the faith you have. And the Lord says, because, it's not because of how big your faith is, because of your willingness. The Lord says, I've heard your prayer. And now I want to pray for those who prayed this prayer for the first time. If you did that, I want to know who you are. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count one, two, and three. And at a count of three, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you didn't quite follow everything, but you, you want it, you, you want it now. At a count of three, immediately I want to raise your hand. You don't need to lift up your head, open your eyes, just keep your head bow, your eyes closed. But by lifting up your hand, you're saying, Pastor Kong, I, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I prayed with you. I want to give my life completely to Jesus. And you keep your hands up and I want to pray a blessing for you. Will you do that right now? I'm going to count right now. Whether you're upstairs on the third floor or you're right here, once I count to three, raise your hand. I'm going to count right now. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Just raise it up high. By raising your hand, you're saying, today I give my life to Jesus. I see your hand. God sees your hand. Keep your hands up. Don't put it down. Is there someone else? Is there someone else? Is there someone else? The Lord says, I died so that you might know me. So that you don't have to quit living you can live life to the fullness. Is there someone else? Just raise your hand now. Father, I thank you for those who have raised their hand. I thank you that you have spoken to them. This day is the day of their salvation. I just declare that you're going to know Jesus and the power of His love, the power of His grace, and you're going to experience the reality of God. Your sins are forgiven. As of today, you are a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we all stand up and give God a round of applause? Thank you for this word. How many of you believe this is a word from God? Let's thank the Lord. Just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. This is what I want to do. I'm going to come to three. No one moving right now. I come to three. All those who have raised your hand just now to trust Christ. And some of you have not raised your hand, but you prayed that prayer. Or some of you, you prayed the prayer to receive Christ in a cell group or in some of the uh, church other meeting, but never on a weekend like that. And never been prayed for by the whole church. If that's what who you are, on a count of three, I want you to take your belongings, leave your seat. The friend who brought you is very happy to walk down with you. And we want to pray a blessing for you. So let's welcome them. One, two, three. Come on, let's welcome them. Come right now. This is a day of salvation. Don't delay. This is the point of time. The Lord says that He is coming soon, but He doesn't want to come back as a judge of your life. He wants to come back to assure you that He has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. You are a child of God. So wherever you are, just come down. Just come down where you are quickly, quickly. We're going to pray for you and we're going to bring you out to a room outside so that we can give you some material and follow up with you. Is there anyone else? Just come quickly. 
And those on the third floor, just go forward too. You come. You come. This is the day of salvation. Is there someone else? You come. Don't feel embarrassed. The Lord says don't give up. Some of you want to give up in life. The Lord says you don't have to. I will be your strength and your salvation. Some of you are lost. The Bible says I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. You feel lost, but today is the day you reunite with your maker. Are there some more? We're waiting for you. Let's stretch our hands, shall we? And say with me, in Jesus' name, we welcome you into the family of God. We will walk with you to experience the Lord together. The Lord bless and keep you. Cause you to know Him. And the power is resurrection. And share in the fellowship of His suffering. So that your life will be abundant. Filled with the presence of God. Filled with the presence of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's welcome them as they go to the room. I know that I know that the time is up, but uh, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna sing this song, and this song is really about the fact that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Church, listen. We're not trying to prove to anyone we are powerful. In fact, the day you feel very powerful, very anointed, very super spiritual, that's the day you better worry. Most of the time, we're just dealing with all the struggles in life, but as we persevere, we can be walking on water without knowing it. We can be touching the power of God without knowing it. We can be touching life without knowing it. And then someday, when we look back, you are shocked. You are shocked at what God has done through you. And my life is filled with shock. I cannot believe that what I see in Love Singapore is taking place. People say, how marvellous it is, how wonderful it is. And you know, not for a minute I dare to take this as a credit for myself. I know I couldn't do it. I know I can't do it. I know I don't have it. I know I didn't even care about doing it at first. But, but God convinced me. There's so many things in life. Isn't that, life is such an adventure, isn't it? That we can go there and it doesn't matter. You don't have to compare with my adventure. Uh, 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 I can't live your adventure. You can't live my adventure. We just venture with God to experience the goodness of God. And if all of us do that, then God is going to see a shining light coming out from this church. And He doesn't need the approval of man. We just need the approval of God. Amen. You know, is there someone here that's quitting here? Is there someone here that, that, that has quitted, has gone up to your team pastor and said, I'm not doing it. I don't think I can make it. I'm too busy. I want to tell you what, don't short train yourself. Hang in there so that you don't lose a crown that could be yours. Others, they are, you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with problems, you're struggling with relationship, and, and you're at the verge of quitting. Today, you just come before the Lord and say, I will not quit. I will live one more day by the power of God. I will live one more hour by the power of God. I will cling to the cross one more moment by the power of God. And that's going, going to be the way we live the rest of our life. Not because we know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we will walk faithfully today. And that's how we become overcomers. Because we are not overcomer. It is Jesus that has overcome. And we walk into His overcoming power. Do you understand that? And some of you need to just realign your life with God. As we sing this, come forward and say, Today, I want to be an overcomer. I will not quit. Whatever that situation is. Let's worship the Lord. You know what? The time is up. I'm going to pray for you. I want the rest of you to go quietly. But... I presume you're standing there because you are an overcomer. Not because you're a tough guy. Not because you're a smart guy. Not because you're talented. God can use you in spite of those things. But God uses us because we are willing. We press in. So let me pray for you. Lift up your hand. Lord, I pray for an overcoming spirit to come upon your people. A spirit not driven by pride, not driven by the flesh, not driven by the self, but a spirit of overcoming because we fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. Lord, because You endured the cross, we will endure with You to the end. The Lord make You a winner 
for the kingdom of God so that you will know Him in a personal and intimate way. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you move away quietly, please? I just feel that some of them just need to be prayed over. Just need that little moment. I know uh, they're going to switch over.